Please uh, take a seat. Thank you very much for coming. I'm very happy to uh, see so many assembled here today. We at the uh, ISTP are very happy to welcome you to uh, today's seminar. And uh, we will start by welcoming Dr. Uh, Yi Sang-hyun from the Sejong Institute. He's a senior research fellow at Sejong Institute. There's a Swedish trick, don't you? South Korean. You hear me anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, so, first we'll have uh, uh, Dr. Lee, and we'll uh, give a small presentation for uh, 20 minutes or, or, or so, uh, and then we'll invite the panel uh, to discuss uh, today's issues. And I think it's very timely uh, to have this seminar today, the day after what someone, well, some, some people describe as the collapse, uh, some people yeah, describe it as otherwise, and uh, the blaming game has begun, uh, well, we hope that the blaming game, game will not continue, but that the talks will continue. But um, anyway, it's a very crucial time, and it's a very important time, uh, and it's uh, a very suitable time to welcome Dr. Lee and ask you to begin with your presentation and then we'll continue after that. So please, take the floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much. <coughs> well, uh, I appreciate ICDP uh, for hosting uh, this very uh, timely uh, seminar about uh, North Korean issue. Well, frankly, uh, this could be much more exciting <laughs> if there was some deal at Hanoi. Uh, unfortunately, this time we did not have any deal. But nevertheless, uh, we have the, uh, some expectation that this kind of dialogue will continue between US and TPLK. So today, uh, I want to try to give us some sense what happened in Hanoi and what's the uh, some challenges uh, in the way ahead to denuclearize North Korea. Okay, um, <coughs> so uh, let's look at what happened in Hanoi. Uh, obviously, we had a high hope when. Uh, So, uh, um, unfortunately, China is quickly become a big, very important player uh, in this game. Next picture. But nevertheless, uh, uh, recently, uh, North Korean delegation uh, met uh, Trump in the White House. Here, Kim Jong-un, Park and Kim Hyuk the so-called three tours, uh, gave some uh, instruction about the uh, upcoming meeting. So, what did John try to uh, show the, the world by his 4,500-kilometer, 66-hour uh, long train journey? Uh, perhaps uh, this is the first time that North Korean leader uh, evacuated uh, their capital uh, so long time. In 
a sense, Kim Jong Un tried to show that he is in full uh, control of the country. At the same time, passing through China, perhaps he wanted to show the world that uh, China is their very strong uh, support of all this game. But nevertheless, uh, the game, uh, the talk, uh, ended with no uh, agreement. So let's get some uh, summary of what happened in Hanoi. Okay, uh, already there were a lot of report uh, about why uh, the talk uh, ended with no agreement. Uh, uh, apparently, the United States demanded a young one plus alpha, which means that North Korea should reveal some more information about other uh, facilities. Uh, in return, North Korea demanded to remove the all sanctions, according to U.S. Uh, report. Later, after Trump uh, uh, left Hanoi, uh, Lee Young Hong and Madam Chesney gave some talk, some different opinion about uh, the uh, region of the uh, North Korea. According to North Korea, uh, says they North Korea have asked only for some sanctions to be lifted, which is uh, left with the most person, civil economy and livelihood. And in, in return, they completely give up uh, Yongbyon uh, facilities uh, in the presence of American experts. But at the later that, uh, later, uh, uh, the, the Pompeo uh, repeated again this, this remark. So, at this moment, we don't know which side is right. But uh, anyhow, it may be uh, some uh, miscommunication or uh, there may be some uh, uh, a difference in the, their perception, maybe. Anyhow, uh, this uh, significantly shows that there's a still a long way uh, to, for a real concept of the denuclearization. And I assume that Dick uh, Miller is this again. Uh, throughout his uh, long uh, trade journey, he already attracted the international media friends. So he, maybe, uh, he got a, a, a fine, a good reputation about what he's doing and so on. Uh, again, Trump team uh, for the lack of strategy and expertise, maybe. Uh, perhaps they may have some strategy. But anyhow, it turned out that something is not well uh, prepared before the soon. So I feel as that why Jim Jong decided to walk out this, uh, this talk, uh, uh, he may have thought about uh, Trump's uh, trouble in U.S. domestic politics. Because of the last one in Washington, D.C., you probably had a Mike Quinn's uh, testimony in the U.S. Congress. And sooner or later, a new report will may come up. And in the near term, uh, Trump may be uh, busy defending his domestic political position rather than, rather than focusing on dealing with North Korea. So, Kim may have thought, thought that uh, Trump may be gone soon, so why was the new term? And also, China's support for Vector, this will be a good uh, 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 support uh, for uh, Kim Jong-un. So, does it mean the collapse of the talk between uh, US and DPRK? Maybe not yet uh, possible, and a future round of summit may be possible. But frankly, and not uh, with much uh, breakthrough is expected. So some people say that it might be a start of a long uh, steel myth. In other words, just a freeze of the North Korean nuclear uh, uh, capabilities. And it can be a new normal, uh, which means that perhaps we have to live with North Korea with uh, nuclear weapons. So this is the rough, uh, first kind of reaction that I have uh, to you. Then uh, in order to uh, why did this outcome or a no deal came about? Uh, people, in order to better understand uh, uh, the, this picture, let's recall a little bit, uh, take a back and uh, the, the look at the process that we uh, reached so far. Okay, uh, 2017, 2018, uh, this was a quite uh, busy uh, years. In uh, 2017, May, uh, President Moon uh, inaugurated. As soon after that, uh, North Korea testified the Fast 14 ICBM. And uh, in the uh, summer of that year, 2017, uh, the famous U.S. print Trump's words of fire and fury remarks. And North Korea's answer, they answered again with the test firing of Fast 14 ICBM. So, throughout the year 2017, uh, the situation was quite tense. Uh, perhaps, uh, if you're in the Korean Peninsula, in Seoul maybe, uh, you have felt the 
uh, uh, intense situation. And Korean, even many Korean media talk about the so-called bloody nose strike by the U.S. Uh, in some kind of military action may happen in Korean game. So it was quite a dangerous moment. But everything, all things changed suddenly uh, with the, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un's New Year address last year. In that speech, Kim mentioned that he had North Korea is willing to join the Winter Olympic, and also uh, they are willing to negotiate uh, a nuclear issue with the United States. Following that, uh, North Korean delegation visit Seoul in February to discuss Winter Olympic issue, and in return, South Korean delegation visit Pyongyang uh, in March that year, and after that, you know what happened. Uh, in North Korea attended the Pyongyang Olympic, and uh, North Korea South uh, summit meeting uh, happened in Panmunjom. So this is the third in the Korean summit. So in Panmunjom Declaration, uh, which happened April 27th uh, last year, uh, basically three things. Uh, one is the ensure the prospect and self reliant reunification. And second one is the, how to reduce military tension on the Korean Peninsula. And third is the establishing uh, lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. And, and, and you see the rather complete denuclearization. Apparently this should be the main topic of the uh, uh, summit, but this came at the last, as a small uh, push. And this was again uh, uh, reaffirmed uh, uh, in uh, Trump Kim summit again. So June 12, uh, uh, Singapore summit, uh, North Korea and the United States over the four uh, things. Uh, first one, the new USDP regulations. The second one is the last thing, stable peace. And third, complete denuclearization. Here again, you see that one, complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And the last one is the repatriation of POW MIA remains, uh, which was sacrificed during the Korean War. Okay. So, based on first uh, uh, Singapore summit happened in Singapore, what can we expect uh, from uh, Kim Trump's uh, second summit and maybe a third summit? Because at this time we couldn't have any deal. Perhaps this can be some of the issues that can be uh, included in the, 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 the heaven, heaven of the, uh, each category. So in the under the complete equalization, uh, perhaps we can put uh, verification with this management of uh, several uh, uh, nuclear uh, related sites like the Pungeri uh, nuclear test site and Dongcheng missile engine test site and perhaps Yongbyon, the director, five megawatt director, may be the key issue here. Well, other than that, all other uh, facilities, like enrichment, uranium enrichment, or reprocessing facilities, that should be con 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 uh, uh, concluded in the uh, complete uh, deindustrialization. That's not all. Uh, freeze on all WMD and visa programs. And perhaps the most important thing is the, the roadmap for uh, future roadmap. Uh, for complete uh, deindustrialization, and eventually those critical will uh, should be uh, again the man of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And under the U.S. regulations, uh, if things uh, went well, uh, perhaps U.S. and uh, North Korea will open a liaison office, office each other in Pyongyang, Washington, and also lifting travel ban for a key North Korean officials and expand the country exchange program. And uh, perhaps the uh, U.S. may remove North Korea uh, from a uh, state disposal terrorism list and exempt high ranking North Korean officials from blacklist. And of course, the uh, key part is the, the economic sanctions. Uh, for example, uh, coal and oil in bubble, gas and industrial complex, Mount Gunga project, and also uh, humanitarian assistance and international financial uh, transactions. All of these should be included in this uh, category. Okay, and probably the peace region. Uh, th this will include uh, some uh, treaty, uh, official ending uh, to the Korean War, and uh, non aggression or peace treaty between US and DPRK. And also uh, military tension reduction uh, uh, steps like uh, holding uh, US Korea joint military exercises. And finally, uh, repatriation of the killed of the MIA remains uh, for the exploitation ex of the remains of from uh, chosen uh, regional battle and so on. So, if, if uh, there are some 
any progress since Singapore or Sony. Perhaps this may be the some uh, kind of bottom list that we could have expected in Hanoi. Maybe they had discussed with this, but this time uh, they couldn't make this as a, a formal agreement between uh, two countries. Okay, this is the Korean joint declaration that happened between North and South Korea in September of last year. So uh, this is basically uh, the, the expansion of the Panjim Declaration, a cessation of hostilities <laughs> and humanitarian cooperation. And uh, 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 Korean things uh, can uh, turn into a, a nuclear weapon, nuclear weapon, uh, uh, nuclear weapon free uh, region, and substantial measures to further advance exchanges and cooperation and so on. And as a as a match to that uh, agreement, uh, both sides agreed to uh, uh, take a actual uh, measures to uh, reduce military tension on Korean Peninsula. Uh, in the in the latter uh, down picture, uh, soldiers are uh, working to uh, exploit the remains of the soldiers killed in uh, during the Korean War. Okay. Uh, so what can be what would be some challenges they have? if we continue uh, uh, negotiation uh, with uh, North Korea. This is some part of the partial history of what we have done before. Uh, North Korea uh, joined the uh, NPT in 1985, and in 1992, both Koreas joined the declaration to the neutralization of the Korean Peninsula. According to this uh, uh, declaration, North Korea should not test, manufacture, produce, receive, possess, store, deploy, or use nuclear weapons. North Korea violated most of them except using nuclear weapons. In 1992, North Korea also uh, signed the IAEA uh, safeguard uh, protocol. But roughly the red line means uh, some kind of breach or violation or back, back step uh, from the agreed uh, upon uh, compromise. Premises. So, we have a lot of good couple of good agreements in the past. For example, in 2005, six party state settlement agreement. Okay? That agreement uh, pledged verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula in a peaceful manner. Okay, if that promise was kept and implemented, perhaps our situation may be far better uh, these days. But one step forward, one step back. This is the typical pattern that we have witnessed so far in many of the North Korea. So, the last one, 2018, North Korea South Summit, U.S. North Korea Summit, if this pattern is uh, correct, maybe the next line may be right. <laughs> but even though I don't expect that. <coughs> so, what kind of deal can we have in the future in North Korea? All the time uh, Singapore summit was held last year, many people were talking about uh, the so-called big deal. Big deal means that it's, it's kind of a complete denuclearization in return for a complete ending of the USD the hostility. So CDID style, including time travel and procedures. And US DPRK will end their hostility and normalize their diplomatic relations and of course lifting all uh, sanctions. Ideally, this could be a big deal. And if that happened, it would be a good thing. But since then, many people were talking about small deal, which is focused on uh, immediate, removing immediate threat to the United States, like ICBMs, and free the nuclear program and the partial uh, roadmap uh, for complete denuclearization. In return, most will provide a the, uh, the official end to the Korean War and the partial lifting of the sanctions like a case uh, industrial complex or a mountain uh, a tourism project. But some people are concerned at Hanoi. Trump may sign a really bad deal. This, luckily, this did not happen in Hanoi. So in case of that, you understand uh, just a freeze or a uh, uh, status quo in a nuclear program, and there was no more detailed roadmap for uh, uh, denuclearization and verification. And in, instead, uh, the weakening of Korea was defense partial against the uh, DPRK and uh, 
uh, simply speaking, uh, too much use for just a symbolic denuclearization uh, uh, steps. So, in the future, what kind of we are trying to uh, uh, get with North Korea? If we uh, can get a big deal, uh, that's a good thing. But if that's possible, the next time maybe the small deal. And in any case, we must avoid a bad deal. And some people even say the small bad deal you know, is the, you know, what, happened, what could happen in Hanoi. But uh, I think uh, uh, perhaps we avoid the bad deal and uh, still get a chance to continue uh, a deal with the, the, the DPRK. So one of the key challenges, as we as already uh, became clear, is there some kind of perception gap between U.S. and uh, DPRK? Uh, most specifically speaking, what is the denuclearization? So perhaps in U.S. view, uh, denuclearization may be more like this: complete, verifiable, and irreversible uh, denuclearization of all uh, North Korean uh, nuclear facilities and capabilities, that's the, the so-called CBID. So in order to do that, uh, for the procedure, we can look at this. First, those that freeze their activities and report or declare their uh, nuclear inventory and inspection, the verification, and dismantlement will follow. And it's not just about nuclear weapon. Dismantle nuclear weapon and their delivery system, missiles, and biochemical weapons, and you go with the infrastructure. All of these must be completely and irreversibly uh, removed from the uh, Korean, North Korean territory. This is what U.S. mean by a complete denuclearization. North Korean view may be a little different. Okay? Denuclearization of the whole Korean Peninsula is not denuclearization of North Korea. What does that mean? Completely remove all nuclear threat against the DPRK meaning the most U.S. nuclear umbrella that it provides to allies like Korea and Japan. And also, the U.S. should not threaten North Korea with strategic or nuclear weapons. And also, uh, the key is the uh, stopping U.S. hostile policy toward North Korea and guarantee for regional security. The last part, U.S. hostile policy. I think that's the, uh, the some, uh, give some idea what those could expect in return for uh, giving up the nuclear weapon. Uh, in the past, 2016-2018, those could have already uh, suggested that they have some uh, certain uh, demands in return for giving up uh, their uh, nuclear weapons. Like uh, some of them doesn't make sense. For example, in 2016, this cause of the USFK nuclear weapon Everybody knows that we don't have a nuclear weapon on the Korean Peninsula. In 1991-92, if you have a tactical nuclear weapon, or we do from the uh, Korean Peninsula, then why <laughs> North Korea make that claim? Perhaps they want to uh, look into the U.S. bases in Korean and South Korean territory. And elimination of verification of U.S. nukes in South Korea, it does also make sense. And also later in 2018, it, it, it does the uh, 2016 demand has been uh, some uh, demands totally doesn't make sense. In 2018, their demand is a little more uh, 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 realistic. So elimination of military threats and guarantee for regional security and peace treaty and diplomatic normalization. And the key is the, this, I think. How to start with a half a pulse to the North Korea? This is the really key to better understand North Korean demands in uh, the price of the uh, denuclearization. You know, North Korea consistently claimed that the origins of the North nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula is uh, from the uh, U.S. hostile policy to North Korea. So what the hell is hostile policy? So stopping U.S. hostile policy to North Korea should include at least three components. One is the political part. Political has the power of stopping political uh, has the policy means that U.S. should recognize North Korea as a normal sovereign state. And if North U.S. Uh, uh, accept North Korea as a normal sovereign state, why they can't establish diplomatic relations? And U.S. should stop disturbing North Korean regime 
stability from outside. And security part. Uh, this includes any the state war in the Korean Peninsula. As you see, since the Korean War, uh, Korean Peninsula is based on the temporary armistice or ceasefire treaty. This temporary treaty must be replaced with more uh, a sustaining uh, peace treaty, permanent peace treaty. And economic part, U.S. should remove the trade restrictions and also remove all economic sanctions imposed by U.S. and United Nations Security Council. So if these three conditions are met, fully met, they are ready to give up uh, their uh, nuclear weapon. So how many of you, uh, how many of you believe that this can be uh, implemented in the next round of a deal uh, between U.S. and DPRK? Some can be uh, agreed, but some can be, some take a much more time and a preparation. And, and more importantly, all those uh, steps, all those uh, measures must be taken step by step, action to action approach. So North Korea already uh, uh, mentioned that they will deal with the three, uh, three stage uh, uh, steps. One is the freeze, the second one is the disable, and the third one is the dismantle. And in response, corresponding to each stage, U.S. should uh, provide some corresponding uh, actions, like a peace treaty or a stopping military exercises, <coughs> and at least the nuclear the strategic uh, weapons and normalize U.S. DPR, the diplomatic relations, lifting economic sanctions, humanitarian assistance, and so on. So if these two categories of action can be, uh, uh, can be uh, uh, battled between two uh, nations, there is a chance that we can see some kind of a deal in, in the future. Okay, another complicated issue is the verification issue. V of the CVA matters. This is what Pompeo had said uh, before. So what is the verification? Verification, simply speaking, is the if, uh, for example, uh, uh, North Korea applies the to dismantle Yongbyo. Okay, in order to confirm that, somebody must be there and actually see and confirm it is actually dismantled. So verification is the kind of procedure that uh, something is actually done as promised in the agreement. Who will do the verification? Uh, typically, there's a good international organization like IAEA or CTVTO. And perhaps another issue will be the, the cost of the uh, verification. Perhaps uh, it will take a decade or many, many years uh, to verify North Korean uh, nuclear uh, dismantlement. Who will, who will pay the cost? That's the other issue. And fish material verification and nuclear weapon uh, verification, this is another complicated issue. And when does verification happen? So in order to confirm some uh, this denuclear state's actual cable, uh, there must be some uh, report or declaration at first. Okay? So if you, if you want to verify something, how can you know uh, what place to visit and what facilities are there out there to verify? So this is why always a declaration or a report is required from the uh, United States. And there must be a clear sense of when uh, verification starts and ends and should be also implemented uh, in parallel with this matter of the activities. So uh, uh, let me give you some example. Yeah, this is a uh, uh, Korean uh, diagram, but actually three parts. One is the improvement program, the second one is the HEU program, and third is the weapon program. All of these must be disabled, dismantled, and verified uh, in the process of dismantling the North Korean nuclear program. And of course, second point is the uh, this actual dismantlement. Many people say that uh, in order to f in, uh, for freeze and preparation, uh, it will take uh, substantial years. If we just uh, try to uh, disable young men uh, nuclear weapons, it, it's a, a simple issue. But if you look at the entire North Korean nuclear program, these many years will be uh, with the necessary time frame. Five years or so uh, for freeze and preparation, and eight or ten years for actual decontamination, demolition, and dismantlement, and two or five years for uh, 
uh, waste, nuclear waste disposal and environmental recovery. And another final uh, interesting, how can we convert those uh, personnel uh, engaged with the industrial and nuclear uh, industry? So roughly, we guess that there are about 2,000 supporting personnel and 200 or so key uh, scientists who actually developed the nuclear weapon. So in case of support personnel, by re-education uh, for civil uh, nuclear sector, they can be relocated to either uh, uh, industry or research institute and so on. The problem is having against the key scientists. In case of the former Soviet uh, republics, uh, some uh, country established the ISTC, the so-called International Science and Technology Center, and that through ISTC, a key scientist can be given a opportunity and new job. But it is purposely dual, dual. So in a sense, ISTC will provide the jobs for those nuclear scientists, but at the same time, is quite an effective control for spread and for the knowledge about the nuclear weapon. Okay, uh, so let me finish with a longer term uh, uh, prospect. So, ending the Korean War, peace treaty, international endorsement, and most of the states of multilateral security mechanism. Perhaps this may be the long path to go in the future. And, uh, and each stage is the uh, uh, associated with the degree of the denuclearization de and uh, what action in North Korea is doing. So, uh, South Korea, North Korea, US, maybe China uh, will declare uh, the, at the end of the Korean War, and next step may be peace treaty and international endorsement and uh, some kind of multilateral uh, security mechanism that can incorporate North Korea as a part of the member in the whole North Asia region. So, the future. Looks like a three dimensional, very complicated uh, uh, game. One is the North Korea South Korea dimension, US and North Korea uh, dimension, and North Korea international community dimension. So I believe these are three dimensions progressing, these are three dimensions must progress in a rock balance. For example, if something doesn't happen in the US and North Korea dimension, like what happened in Hanoi, perhaps North Korea, South Korea, Corporates cannot proceed much. And also, of course, internet community will not make much interest uh, to uh, uh, give some uh, financial support for the North Korean economy. So, uh, there are many opportunities for multilateral cooperation. And obviously, inspection and verification, dismantling, converse, all these areas, we need some international cooperation. And we, of course, we have some lessons from the past, like a TICA, Kilo, General Agreement, Kilo, and Six Party Talk, and perhaps even EU and ASEAN have some role uh, in uh, supporting and helping uh, this uh, long uh, process. So, a bit of time, let me conclude. Okay, <laughs> score card so far. I <laughs> think I will score Trump King to Trump Zero. And no deal. Not for since Singapore uh, Because the, this may be recorded as another diplomatic fiasco for Trump team. Uh, it turned out that uh, Trump team has very limited expertise uh, to handle those Korea's very uh, shrewd and uh, experienced uh, counterpart. And in some, sometimes I think that uh, this is again uh, evidence that unbearable Latin is US president. Perhaps Trump may have thought about something too carefully and too lightly. And uh, China's shadow may be much bigger in the coming days. Uh, so in a sense, the U.S. DPRK deal may be part of the uh, bigger picture, which is the U.S.-China relations. And uh, this is another setback for inter-Korean relations. Uh, there is a plan to expand the North-South economic cooperation uh, may lose steam. And in a sense, South Korea is the, the biggest collateral damage, I think. So, shall we feel disappointed or mild? I, I think <laughs> mixed. Uh, no deal, maybe better than a bad deal, in the sense we are mild. And also, uh, interesting this time, even though the talk and the emotion, North Korean media does not report any harsh rhetoric against the 
the United States, meaning that they also expect some kind of another meeting uh, between two countries. So in a sense, it left the room for continued dialogue. Uh, so perhaps we, we may watch uh, Trump King's show uh, season three in the next year somewhere around. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. I think we will wait with the questions and, and we'll be directed to the panel. And uh, then uh, we can have plenty of time for questions and comments after that. So we now move to uh, the panel section. And what we have here uh, are uh, four distinguished gentlemen. Uh, one is serving water, and the others are already sitting down. But Sang Su will find the chair in there. <laughs> so Dr. Uh, Lee Sang Su, uh, who is heading the uh, Korea Center at uh, ISDP. Then we have uh, uh, General Mats Engel, who is also working at the ISDP. We have uh, Dr. Lee uh, Sang Kyu, uh, who just gave the, the uh, excellent presentation. And then we have Dr. Nika Swanstrom, who is the uh, director of ISDP. Could I begin with a question and, and expect very brief answers uh, from, from all of you, uh, starting by uh, uh, Dr. Lee Sang Su. Um, what was your take on the, uh, on the summit? Is it a failure or how would you uh, like to describe it? And then if each of you could uh, comment on the, uh, your impression of the, the, the summit. Do you have a mic? Oh, okay. I have to give it to <laughs> you. Uh, after the summit, uh, I think some parties will gain more and others will lose more. Uh, first, for Trump, uh, as Dr. Lee also said, um, the uh, New Deal was better than uh, bad deal. Uh, I think uh, although there was no agreement, uh, Trump uh, sent a very clear message uh, if North Korea is not doing more, there is never no sanction left in. Uh, now Trump gave the ball to North Korean side and then uh, North Korea, if they want to continue this negotiation, uh, North Korean side, they should provide a new proposal, a uh, much better one, which U.S. should uh, they feel attractive. Uh, the second way, um, North Korea, I think they will be uh, more in a hurry uh, because uh, the leader promised uh, with his people uh, some kind of economic growth or economic development. Uh, in that sense, uh, I guess uh, Chairman Kim Jong Un will meet Xi Jinping in Beijing, and he will tell uh, Xi, "Oh, look, uh, I tried my best, but U.S. didn't agree, and you should help us more economically and politically." If North Korea could get something, then it would be fine when he was on the way back home. Uh, South Korea, actually Dr. Lee also said, I think uh, South Korea was his uh, bigger uh, loser. Uh, the moon's peace process probably might be delayed where all proposed inter-Korean project also will be delayed. And I think um, after owning off this stop and go negotiation, maybe South Korean people will lose their interest, and then the government also will lose some momentum. And then China, actually, I think China is a bigger uh, winner. Uh, because in, after this uh, unexpected Hanoi summit, 
uh, Chinese role will be increasing. Because North uh, Korea also said that on the New Year uh, speech, uh, North Korea can go for a new path if the uh, uh, U.S. is not providing what uh, North Korea wants to get. So probably uh, China will uh, play more role. Thank you. And uh, General um, Thank you, Lars. Um, do like this, I hope you can hear me. I, for my first thing, I was surprised by the new deal, no deal outcome. I was disappointed, but maybe so far it's not a disaster. But I think one thing that will keep ringing in my ear and my head is unpredictability. I think once more, the US president showed to the world that he is unpredictable when conducting foreign policy. And I think something this part of the world, and especially when we are talking about nuclear issues currently, does not need is further unpredictability. Iran deal, INF treaty, review oh, process yes. coming up on the MPT, and also the new US uh, policy when it comes to their own uh, domestic uh, policy concerning nuclear issues. So I think there will be a lot of discussion and analysis uh, among the regional actors on what that means for regional security. And maybe we can come back to that, Lars, about regional security, because that's my main concern at the moment. Thank you. Uh, some of the curiosity that I have is that uh, this is kind of a unique summit uh, with no result. If both sides do not expect uh, outcome or compromise, usually they will delay the summit and prepare well uh, to have a good outcome. But it seems to me why both US and DPRK decided to meet Hanoi without certainty that they will reach some agreement. So this, that's one uh, mystery that I have. And also uh, another point that I uh, need to mention is that uh, some uh, maybe miscommunication between two parties about the what happened in the Hanoi meeting. So Yongbyon plus Alpha, uh, uh, at least the U.S. Uh, 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 the, the explanation like this: uh, the U.S. demanded the Yongbyon plus something more, and in return, uh, North Korea demanded that they lift all sanctions. But as I mentioned, uh, uh, Madame Chosani and Liu, uh, after uh, after Trump left the Hanoi, they have a, a measure that the, the press conference that they just demanded some lifting some sanctions, possibly five sanctions uh, that, that was imposed to between 2016 and 17. So, I don't know which side is uh, uh, right at this moment. But my theory is like this. Uh, look at, I looked at the five sanctions that North Korea demand to be lifted. Uh, 2020, 17, and uh, 17, 2030, 2020, something like that. Uh, those were sanctions imposed after 2016. Uh, North Korea's fourth uh, nuclear uh, 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 test. Which are most severe and most tough sanctions that were imposed on the North Korea? Those in, uh, sanctions include the, the, the quota, lifting quota of the uh, petroleum uh, uh, input to North Korea. And also a uh, ban on ag North Korea's export of agricultural and fisheries for that, and so on. So, in a sense, what those are five sanctions those were demanded. Is virtually all sanctions, I think. So because of that, Trump may have thought that a young man may be not enough to lift those five sanctions. That's why the uh, US demanded this, something more other than a young man. Perhaps that ARPA, uh, there's a lot of report, uh, voice in the New York Times report that comes on uh, in which first maybe something more that the US wanted to uh, get pledge from the in North Korea. But uh, let's uh, wait and see what uh, some more detailed uh, uh, analysis. Thank you. Uh, so, 
Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Well, the thing is, it's, I, of course, it's a failure in the sense that uh, we didn't come out with, a, with an agreement. Um, the challenge, of course, is I think this will create more division between the major parties on the Korean Peninsula. China, Russia, South Korea, the United States, Japan, and all that, we are becoming less on the same page. So we will see a division where we can actually see China and Russia and also to a certain extent South Korea demanding lifting of sanctions, at least the humanitarian. And this is actually something that the North Koreans are skillfully using. I mean, um, so I think that when we look at this, the, the challenge here is really to, to keep the international community together. and. My biggest concern is actually, to, to touch upon a bit, it's the South Koreans, the biggest ca casualty, and then pr uh, President Moon. President Moon has a very weak domestic position. Uh, he's been criticized for economic failure. His su support has been going down. If he loses momentum, I think the most important actor in the Green Peninsula loses momentum. I think the South Korean policy has really been the policy driving forward towards um, more dialogue and cooperation. So if you lose the, the, the South Korean momentum, I, I'm more concerned. But at the same time, I don't think we should paint the devil <laughs> on the wall yet, or paint everything in pitch black. Um, the dialogues continue, uh, even at the different level, and of course, we're far away from each other, but what could you expect? Sanctions and denuclearization, we knew that from the beginning, that it would be extremely difficult issues. So yes, it was a failure, but, well, not all is lost, I would say. Thank you. Uh, if I can <coughs> continue and, and build on uh, what uh, General Engman said about the regional uh, impact, uh, what do you think will be the, uh, the impact on Chinese, uh, U.S. relations, uh, Japanese, uh, Korean, uh, both South Korean and North Korean relations, and, and inter-Korean relations? I mean, how, how will, will this in any way change uh, the, uh, the game, or will other processes begin with with, uh, uh, with, with, with increased speed, or will it speed, uh, with the speed, um, with a new speed? Uh, there are many aspects, uh, if you look at it in the regional process. I don't know who would like to begin. Perhaps the one who... Who raised the issue. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a real risk for increased regional tension because of the failure of uh, uh, the Hanoi summit. That was a golden opportunity because everything was pegged up for a, some kind of an agreement. And I think a lot of the uh, Asian countries had invested both faith and uh, promises in this, uh, uh, this meeting. Uh, it once more turned out to be, as I mentioned, unpredictability. And if you combine that with an already existing rather tense security situation in, in Asia. With an ongoing arms race, you have the dispute between US and China, not only on trade, but especially on the security side in the South China Sea. You have China and Taiwan. So there is a lot of tension already in the area. And if you don't add the dimension of this area having to manage, if I may say so, a nuclear-capable North Korea for the foreseeable future, or at least that future timeline has now become even more unpredictable. Because there is no timeline. And that was maybe one of the outcome of the meeting that was possible to, to say something about the process of denuclearization. So I think a lot of these nations will have to take a careful look on their own security mechanism, including what kind of mitigating actions they may take in order to defend from a return to a 2017 situation. Because 
I don't think that will happen, but if you are head of state and government of a country, your first priority is your own serenity and the safety of your citizens. So I think we risk having a bit of a increase in tension combined with maybe an arms race, but which is still going on. And also this concern that I raised in my first intervention about the nuclear dimension with the combined the Iran deal, the INF treaty, the upcoming review of NPT, and now with a possible uh, nuclear capable North Korea that the world accepts for the foreseeable future. So I think we have a rather explosive cocktail uh, of negative trends. A uh, very short comment. Uh, in, a, in a short term, uh, I think uh, Trump's uh, first America policy will undermine uh, U.S. allies with South Korea and Japan. Uh, we know uh, during the, the press conference yesterday, Trump also mentioned about the joint military exercise. It's, he said it's too expensive. And then <laughs> I know he's personality, but uh, he used this chance to give some pressure to South Korean side. Uh, fortunately, it's, uh, there was no deal, so no issue about the withdrawing of the U.S. Army uh, from South Korea. But uh, in the long term, uh, it could be on the agenda on the, the U.S. side, uh, because it's also very expensive for Trump, maybe. Uh, and then uh, another issue, you know, long term issue is uh, if a North Korean nuclear issue is not solved uh, in a long term or in a short term, and then a more uh, public opinion about um, uh, South Korea also wants to have their own nuclear weapon, and it is also happening in Japan. It's not yet, but uh, I'm more concerned this consideration will be increasing. So, it's, uh, I'm always pessimistic. <laughs> that is my short comment. Well, uh, regional uh, impact. Uh, I, I didn't mention in my presentation, but perhaps I mentioned that uh, Kim Jong-un is a big winner uh, at Hanoi. But even bigger winner may be China. Um, it's already uh, apparent that when uh, Kim Jong-un decided to travel with train throughout China's many cities. So what does that uh, tell you? Uh, China already, uh, uh, Xi Jinping already met Kim Jong-un both times. Yeah. So perhaps it's not that difficult that uh, we imagine what kind of conversation they have. Uh, perhaps uh, in Kim Jong's calculation, even though deal with the U.S. may fail, uh, China can be another insurance for their, his region and country. So that's why I said uh, uh, the shadow of China may be bigger uh, in the uh, coming uh, negotiations. So, and also, uh, uh, because of that, uh, we need to uh, think about uh, in order to uh, denuclearize North Korea, perhaps China, U.S. relations should be uh, much more important uh, than before. That's the well, you mentioned actually insurance for, for North Korea. China can be insurance for North Korea. But it can also be actually insurance for Trump. Uh, and, well, in a negative way. Because what happens now is that uh, President Trump has lost a foreign policy victory. He has a very few opportunities to make a, a domestic uh, victories. He's going to be very preoccupied with domestic, uh, well, with all the hearings and everything. China becomes the next foreign policy victory he wants to score. So what happens now is that the Chinese are looking at this and they see that the stake just went up. If I were a Chinese diplomat at this time, I would definitely raise the bar a bit. Because Trump needs that insurance to cash in. He needs to be able to say, I'm a, I walked away from one deal, I scored on the other one. 
if he walks away on two foreign policy deals, where can he have a game? So I think that it's going to be extremely interesting to follow the negotiations now and see how willing President Trump is to compromise on the Chinese agenda. And I think the Chinese are looking forward to a pretty decent deal. And um, so in that sense, the Chinese are a winner. And even if people say that the Korean Peninsula is not transferring over to South China Sea and the economy and all that, of course it is. It's all a global game. Um, so I think that's a recommendation now to follow the next trade negotiations. That's going to be extremely interesting to see. And I, you said two to Kim, zero to Trump, maybe then one to Xi Jinping. So it's going to two, one, zero. I miss my prediction. Thank you very much. Uh, we will open up very briefly for, for uh, questions and comments, but maybe we can have one last round. Uh, and uh, if you could uh, say something about what you expect would be the immediate next step. Uh, and how, uh, also, is there any realism in, in that step being uh, somehow the six party talks being looked at, that you can expand the, the uh, US DPRK format into, again, a, a six party talk format? And I don't know who would like to start. <coughs> Dr. Lee. Perhaps. <laughs> 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 immediate uh, uh, situation after the Hanoi summit. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I think uh, the deadlock situation will continue for a while because uh, there is still a big gap between the two sides, between DPRK and the US. The most key sticky issues are uh, lifting sanction and uh, uh, notification issue, I think. Because uh, uh, in Hanoi, it was on the negotiation table, certainly uh, the uh, US brought up these uh, new young gun facilities, uh, uranium bases, and then uh, actually the John Bolton, actually certainly he joined this negotiation uh, uh, table. And then uh, they brought up this new issue, as uh, I think it's a notification issue will come up again and again even if they start to resume the, the next dialogue of uh, negotiation. And then on the uh, North Korean side, they will continue to ask lifting sanctions again and again. Those two key fundamental, uh, those uh, demands by both sides are not solved or they couldn't find the common ground to be compromised. And then the, the, the problem will continue and again and again. So, in a short term, uh, as long as North Korea is not testing, the U.S. is not uh, conducting joint military exercise, for a while the state, status quo situation will continue. And then I don't think uh, North Korea will uh, make a uh, whole situation upside down in the near future. And then uh, Trump, maybe he's also happy with uh, this um, state for situation. And then always he's saying, keeping saying, oh, I did better job than Obama. And then uh, he's used this for himself. And the six party talks. Uh, I uh, still have a negative view on six party talks because even by virtual process, it's not going well. But this time is a top-down approach. And then the first thing I think, as I said, those key fundamental two issues, if it's still there, the first thing they could uh, start uh, to solve those issues. Otherwise, any other process or any other format the meetings cannot solve this difficult issue. Uh, the immediate future, Lars, uh, 
I think there will be a pause now where the two main parties will uh, go back to the quarters. Uh, they will do a thorough analysis on what did really happen, try to analyze thoroughly the respective uh, outcome uh, and what was said by the, the two delegations. And then hopefully, in the meantime, <coughs> and that's, it's very difficult to, to make a prediction on this, I think, but hopefully there will be some low-level interaction with, between the two delegations, and hopefully Mr. Moon will once more be able to, to play this facilitator and, and use his good offices to get the parties talking again. Uh, and I think, referring to my previous uh, uh, prediction about the regional in, uh, tension, I think this is the most crucial point to avoid that tension, is to fairly quickly get the train back on the tracks uh, and it, in a transparent manner, so that you show to the regional actors that yes, we do have a, a process that has been confirmed by the two top leaders. Uh, like uh, Dr. Lee, I don't believe in, in the six-party format. I think it's complex as it is. Uh, and to bring in Russia, which is one of the uh, six-party uh, members, would even make this uh, whole adventure even more complex. So I don't think that's a, a, a good way forward. Thank you. Well, uh, I think Harmony Summit is a really uh, a strange summit. Uh, in usual case, if there was no outcome, uh, perhaps uh, North Korean media, for example, North Korean and K, uh, North Korean Central Juice Agency will pour out, out a lot of harsh rhetoric against the uh, United States. But this time they are calm, very calm. So meaning that North Korea expects another round of talk. And also Trump, even though there was no deal, those Republicans, Democrats are praising him for not making a bad deal. So there's a lot of room for a next round of a meeting between two countries. Uh, that's why I said, it, even though there was no deal, uh, it's not may not be a total collapse of dialogue between the uh, two uh, countries. But at least I hope Trump found some lessons from this meeting. The, the so-called top-down or big shot uh, uh, summit may not be the only way to handle this business. So in a sense, uh, next round of meeting, maybe there may be a lot of a low level or uh, uh, sub-level uh, uh, meeting between two nations, so that uh, they prepare well-drafted uh, documents, and uh, perhaps that's the, 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 that's the uh, some kind of a, a different style, maybe. So uh, that's what I expect. And uh, I couldn't mention about the inter-Korean relationship because in the previous and let me just give one point. Well, uh, this is much. Uh, First, uh, you know, uh, March 1st is a very big day in Korean history. In 100 years ago, uh, Korean, uh, the Southern Freedom Movement, uh, there's a, a national uh, rally against the uh, uh, Japanese colonial. And on this emotional day, Putin was planning to announce a very huge economic cooperation plan with <laughs> North Korea because things went well in North so in that sense, uh, perhaps his uh, inter-Korean economic project may be setting <laughs> set back <laughs> significantly. So I don't know how, how will uh, he manage it uh, in the coming days. But basically, Moon Jae-in is trying to expand uh, inter-Korean economic cooperation dramatically. And through that, he leads denuclearization. Of course, it's controversial. Many people in Korea all oppose that idea. The Korean first, and then South Korean Bundy should do economic cooperation. So, which one comes first? We don't know yet. Uh, well, actually, I, I would agree with most. It's going to be more of the muddling through uh, approach, lower level interaction, all that. But it's interesting to see where the different delegations traveled after the summit. I mean, all are now traveling up to Beijing, to Moscow. Uh, in the press conference today, North Korea opened up for greater com complex with South Korea. So now people are positioning themselves 
try to bring in these different actors, maybe not in a six-party talks manner, but I think it's going to be more multilateral, simply because I think the, the two main actors have realized that they're not moving forward, so therefore they need uh, others to, to break this. And what makes me, I don't know if I'm worried or optimistic, in the press conference today, when Madame Che said that uh, maybe the leader will have a new direction, that can either be very positive or it can be somewhat negative or it means nothing. But I think that we're going to see a change of interaction. And uh, I, I do expect a great role, especially from China and South Korea. I think they will be much more influential in the coming uh, couple of months. But that said, I mean, there's, it's going to be a continuous interaction, multilaterally and bilateral, between North Korea and uh, the United States, without that. Thank you very much. I think uh, now is, uh, we have time for, uh, for uh, questions and, and comments. And since we are uh, quite a few of us, maybe you can keep uh, the questions as pointed as possible. Uh, I think we'll start with three questions. Uh, we have a mic here uh, that functions, and then <laughs> we will run back and forth. But in order not to run so much back and forth, we'll take three questions and then uh, hand back mic. And we'll start over there. And then there's a question in the back there. And maybe a third question somewhere? There, yes, okay. Talking a lot of international correspondent. I wonder if you can uh, comment about all the idea of Donald Trump being awarded a Nobel Prize. And as some leaders were saying, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Gabriel Johnson, Stockholm University of Korean Studies. I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, in the case of um, uh, denuclearization, uh, we all know that uh, it's um, a Trump card to, to have them, and uh, it is um, uh, the, the ultimate target of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons to get rid of them from the whole world. But, uh, the U.S. has not said anything about uh, denuclearization, so h how can we expect North Korea to agree on denuclearization from that point of view? That's my first question. And the other one concerns ending the uh, Korean War. Uh, since 1974, America and uh, DPRK have disagreed on who would sign uh, a peace treaty and uh, this uh, dispute cannot be expected to uh, to end. So uh, how uh, to deal with, with this disagreement if the question of, uh, of, of um, uh, officially ending the Korean War is to be resolved? Thank you. <coughs> My name is Christel Lundgren. Uh, I wonder, um, in the... President Trump's State of the Union message, he said that had he not been chosen president, there would be a war already in Korea. Do you think that was only rhetoric, or is there any truth behind it? Thank you. We have three, we have four questions. Uh, and uh, who would like to answer? I can take the last one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Young, I can take the last one your question about uh, would there be a war without Mr. Trump? No, I don't think so. Um, as some of you know, I, I served in uh, the demilitarized zone between uh, 2015 and 17 during the peak of the tension. And, and so I lived through this area of maybe the highest tension there has been over the years since the uh, after the Second World War. Um, and I was not afraid of a deliberate war. What I was afraid of was incidents escalating, but not a war by design and a decision in Washington or Pyongyang. Uh, so I don't think uh, he can claim that it would have been a war without him. Um, 
But what he has done, and I think we need to give credit to that, is that he changed the equation and made the dialogue that we now see possible. Um, so I don't think there would have been a war. And may I also say a few words about the about signing of a peace treaty. I don't think the difficulties would be in who signs the treaty, because if there would be a long process um, negotiating a peace treaty, which would be a very, very long, I think down the, during that process, they would be able to find a solution on who should be signing. And I suppose you refer back to the Armistice Agreement, which was signed by United Nations Command, uh, China, uh, and respectively North Korea. And uh, for a peace treaty, I think most parties would now agree that South Korea need to be part of such a, uh, a formal declaration as a peace treaty. So I don't think that would be the biggest hurdle. The biggest hurdle would be the content of the treaty. Thank you. Uh, let me add uh, just a few more points. Um, in the past agreement between two Koreas, in case of either official end of the Korean War or a peace treaty, always both Korea mentioned that three or four parties will sign the, uh, uh, the eventual document. So in that case, who will be three? Uh, US, North Korea, South Korea, maybe one possibility. Or uh, South, uh, South Korea, US, and China uh, is another possibility. And two Korea, US, China, four party is, is also a possibility. So in case of the ending of the official declaration to end the Korean War, I, I just look at the, the back the, the document. So three people, Kim Il sung as a representative of the DPRK, and Mark Clark as a representative of the United Nations Forces, and Peng uh, who uh, as a representative of the People's Voluntary Army. Uh, the, the name is <laughs> uh, funny, but anyhow, PRC. So these three were uh, key signatory of the, of the Army's Treaty. But as I as I agree uh, uh, that South Korea is inevitably to become a very important party to this uh, whole structure. So no matter what, it be a ending the declar a ending declaration to the Korean War or uh, peace treaty, at least South Korea should be both Korea and uh, maybe U.S. and China can be. I think this idea. Uh, parties to sign those documents. Well, uh, actually, uh, just to build on what, uh, starting to build on what Matt said here about um, uh, Donald Trump, no, I mean, he did not prevent the war, but he did actually, by his unpredictability, create the, the fundamentals. And I come back, does he deserve a Nobel Prize for that? No, he doesn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think. On the, on the other side, if we actually been extremely successful, where I think it's um, impossible because the denuclearization takes years, not... Oh, sorry. Um, if we've been managed to actually denuclearize North Korea, totally verifiable and all that, I could have thrown it to him. Uh, but it's not the Swedish thing, it's actually the Norwegian problem. So we, 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 I think we're going to leave that issue to, to Oslo. And uh, they have made some interesting choices before, so maybe that comes back again. But to talk about um, the peace treaty, I think it's interesting also because we have a declaration of peace which can be independent, bilateral, um, which is not as extensive. That can be done between North Korea and the United States, simply to declare there's no war. But then actually more a treaty in itself needs to have more actors, it needs to be much more well-developed. That will also involve economic interaction, or political interaction, and all of that. Then we need all of the four actors. I mean, uh, for me, it's, it's a non-issue. Um, South Korea has to be involved, China has to be involved, and of course, North Korea and the United States. So, if you actually do not include one of the actors, I think we're looking for a disaster. So, they, this is just a practical um, problem that that we can that we have to deal with. Dr. Lee? Uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, even if uh, the <laughs> Trump uh, uh, will 
win and prize. But it should be shared with uh, Kim Jong, Chairman Kim Jong Un and uh, President Moon. It's not fair if <laughs> so to only get this. <laughs> And then I, I, certainly I wonder if uh, the, the money or price is going to North Korea is related to sanctions or not. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the Professor Gabriel Jungson's question about uh, uh, I think uh, ideologically uh, the Nuclear free world is is the best way, but uh, when it comes to this international relations and and the, and the power uh, game, all those things, I don't think um, uh, North Korea is is going for denuclearization. Then U.S. has to be the same. But from North Korean perspective, yes, they hope, but it's not gonna happen. Uh, maybe uh, alternative uh, options is U.S. Uh, could consider uh, withdraw their uh, strategic nuclear weapons uh, from the Korean Peninsula, and then and don't use this, those uh, strategic weapons uh, during the uh, military exercise if they need to, to resume the, the, the exercise. Uh, peace treaty issue, uh, actually South Korea, uh, the president Lee Seung Man refused to join uh, the sign uh, the, uh, uh, um, the army uh, treaty. Uh, but uh, in reality, I think South Korea is is very important uh, party when it comes to future uh, signing uh, peace treaty. Uh, technically was excluded, but the uh, uh, content and uh, when it comes to South Korea's position, uh, sharing the board with uh, the North and all those things, South Korea should be included uh, in the next uh, uh, signing uh, peace treaty. And the last question, um, because of Trump, so there is no war, I don't agree. <laughs> Uh, is that, from my perspective, actually, uh, North Korea uh, used their uh, nuclear development, nuclear test, in order to sit down with the U.S. side for negotiation. So, and then both sides, I, I think the same, uh, because of the gain and uh, raise their leverage of over the next uh, future negotiation, they use the power, they used their uh, anything they have as soon as much as possible. So I don't think they intended to, to have start the war. Thank you. We have uh, time for one more round. Uh, one question here, and one in the back, and one in the, in the very back. Uh, starting here. Uh, my name is Fabio Mitman. I would like to know, I would like to reflect on Mr. Swanstrom's uh, global view. If, if peace is, is recognized in the peninsula and uh, a treaty is reached, what will happen to the U.S. troops, to the security umbrella brought to Japan, to South Korea, etc.? What will the role, what, how will you justify the U.S. presence in the area? Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I have two questions. The, the number one is, uh, what does Vietnam expect from uh, the U.S. to this uh, Submit. And the second one is, how does Vietnam uh, proceed North Korea to follow uh, Vietnam development models? Thank you very much for the presentations and the comprehensive uh, discussion. 
what uh, uh, in one of the things that intrigues me is why Kim uh, Jong Un uh, demanded uh, demanded uh, lifting of uh, all sanctions, and uh, I say this because uh, um, uh, from my well, some experience of these uh, issues, uh, this is a uh, 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 as has been shown here, a sequential process, action for action. And so, I mean, uh, what uh, really puzzles me a bit, why uh, was it a gamble? What is he, what is he, what was he, he trying to gain from this negotiation? Uh, you know, escalating his demands and saying, well, uh, we want all sanctions lifted. This, for, of course, according to reports and according to what uh, President uh, Trump himself said. Thank you. So, no, you didn't need to take off my glasses so I can actually read my own writing. Um, well, what will be the role of the United States be and how do you justify it? Um, we can argue that in many ways, but we can now to the facts, China. China will be the main actor that the United States will have to deal with. Um, and it's the same with Japan. I mean, Japan doesn't necessarily view North Korea as the main threat over time. It is China. So if the United States would remain, that becomes a natural thing. Will they say it? More or less, probably. But there's always, always there's other ways to justify that as well. Uh, but I think China will be the the, uh, the big challenge. And needless to say, I mean, right now there's a lot of discussion around China and China's behavior and all that. It would be not too difficult for the United States or any other power to justify that. Um, I'm not saying that's the correct way to do it, but I'm saying that's probably going to happen. Talking about Vietnam now, actually, I'm almost referring to the ambassador here, <laughs> who could probably explain that much better. But uh, when talking about the Vietnamese development model, I think it is it is interesting for Kim Jong Un. Um, I think this is something he was definitely interested in looking at. Will he develop North Korea according to the Vietnamese model? No. This is about cherry picking. He's interested in figuring out how you can keep the political system without challenging stability. In some ways, he's looking at China, he's looking at Vietnam, he's looking at these different models and trying to figure out what can I use. I'm not very optimistic, and I hope my, my colleagues is more optimistic, I'm not very optimistic to see a more liberalized economy in, in Vietnam. We've gone that, down that road many times. We go down a certain length and then we retract. Because this is also about political stability and it is a big challenge. Um, then it comes down to, to the gentleman there, why Kim Jong Un demanded that all sanctions to be lifted. And why did they try to bite over a bigger piece of meat than they could chew? Well, both of them tried that, in a sense. Uh, the United States demanded way too much, in, a, in, a, in one way, from the North Koreans. There was no possibility for the North Koreans to agree on denuclearization at this stage. And of course, there was no possibility for the United States or the international community to agree on lifting all the sanctions that uh, Professor Lee was mentioning, because that's the bulk of it. So I think it was, it could, you know, we, of course this is speculation because I don't know, but it was most likely a bit of a gamble, but also a misunderstanding of the other person's negotiation position. Because I think Trump believed that Kim was much weaker and he needed that reform, and he wanted that reform. And I think uh, Kim Jong-un also believed that due to the political situation in the United States, the, uh, he would be eager to get the deal. So I think they overestimated their positions there. And don't believe the North Koreans don't know what happens in the United States. You know, actually, the first time, the f six months before Donald Trump was elected, 
the North Koreans predicted he would win the election. There was no other person I heard at that stage from who actually could predict Donald Trump to be winner. The analysis was top notch. The North Koreans are extremely skillful. They're very good diplomats, they know their stuff, and these are absolutely no idiots at all. And I think that's the, the American underestimation of the North Koreans. Sometimes they give the impression of being not so advanced, but they are extremely skillful. I think that's something we need to realize. Almost as skillful as the South Koreans. <laughs> Well, uh, whenever we talk about North Korea's uh, opening its door and uh, reform, uh, many uh, uh, North Korea experts in Korea says that their style is a kind of mosquito net style opening, meaning that fresh air comes in, but bad <laughs> insect cannot come in their system. But what does it mean? So even though North Korea, maybe looking at China or Vienna for their economic development. But it's exactly cherry picking. They want to get some good aspect of their economic development at the same time blocking bad influence from outside world. So will that be possible? It can be possible only in North Korea because North Korea is a controlled society, strictly controlled society. Still government mechanism functions well in that direction. So uh, probably if North Korea do some kind of reform or opening its door, it will be North Korean style, not neither Chinese or neither Vietnam, Vietnamese style. And also, uh, Kim Jong-un, why he demanded the lift of all economic sanctions? I have two interpretations. One is that North Korean economy is really bad because of the continued maximum pressure uh, for the past few years. So there are a lot of reports that uh, those kind of economy, even though Pyongyang may be better, but the overall situation, uh, the whole country, economic situation may be pretty bad. So uh, because of that, Kim uh, jong indeed wanted to uh, lift some sanctions and get uh, economic boost for their uh, economy. And at the same time, uh, when I heard that North Korea demand to lift all sanctions. My impression is that North Korean uh, bargaining style, at the first shot, they demand the maximum. And through negotiation, they take one step back and get a substantial good part as a second uh, level good. So, Kim Jong un may have a, a understand pretty well about Trump's situation. Uh, Former uh, U.S. Representative Joseph Yoon, who uh, negotiated with North Korea, he yesterday in, on the CNN he mentioned that sometimes he was surprised that North Korea was quite well aware of the Washington situation, politics, domestic politics. Okay. <coughs> so probably in Hanoi, uh, Kim Jong Un may have watched the CNN and <laughs> Michael Cohen's <laughs> testimony in the U.S. Congress, and we, he may have thought about that. Uh, Kim, uh, Trump may be uh, gone soon. So because of that, uh, okay, let's toss him the maximum uh, demand that he can. If Trump accepts that, that's fine. Oh, so if he declines, what's the worry? He can deal with the next president. So probably that's one of the uh, uh, calculations in his uh, mind. Thank you. I I think I'll limit myself to a response to the question about the uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula and, and the presence of US troops. Um, uh, as most of you may know, technically speaking, those two questions are not related. I mean, uh, the US presence, uh, military presence in, in South Korea is because of a defense treaty with South Korea, two independent countries that have signed a military agreement. So with that, they could remain, but at least there will be one element that will, and I think they would for strategic reasons, as Nicholas said, uh, would like to remain. Uh, but one thing that will be different is this kind of economic burden sharing, because if the main reason for the US presence over the long run is not the threat from North Korea, 
and that South Korea doesn't view that as being the essence of the, the treaty. I think the, the US claim of asking South Korea to shoulder a bigger part of the cost of those troops will be very difficult to hammer in. And as you know, they have just closed a, uh, an agreement where South Korea had to pay more. And uh, Donald Trump has also indicated after the agreement that next year they will pay a, even more. So I think that issue will be difficult for the Americans to sustain the argument. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, North Korea definitely tried the uh, uh, Vietnamese model, uh, but in a, a North Korean way. But uh, uh, in terms of size of country and the size of public uh, uh, population, North Korea would be more interested in Vietnamese model than the Chinese model. And then I think North Korea has also seen other countries' experience who are involved in one belt one road. Maybe they, they think is if we are also joining this heavily, then Chinese political influence or economic influence will increase in North Korea as well. So there is the challenges and concerns uh, when it comes to Chinese model for North Korea. Uh, but I don't think uh, if North Korea is too much concerned about um, the, the outside information uh, coming into North Korea would bring uh, some uh, political uh, instability. Uh, I think. Uh, under this sanction, international sanction, uh, it was two years ago and then uh, three years ago that uh, they made uh, some kind of economic growth. It was not big. And then, uh, of course, it's, they will control the speed and then, then uh, also at the same time they will control more people. But they will try definitely uh, 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 a kind of opening up uh, economic policy. And then if the leader uh, could make a, a small uh, economic growth, and then people are more, will have more loyalty to the regime. Because uh, my perspective, people will think more, and they are, they are comparing uh, their situation, current situation, with the past, not comparing with other countries' situation. And then if they, they feel, oh, this is much better than before, then they will more, more respect the, the leader and then they willing to follow the, the North Korean regime's policy. And then if the regime makes a uh, uh, smaller progress, maybe they will try bigger step, slowly, and then if they make more progress, then uh, certainly it's sort of the uh, Vietnamese model. I'm not sure at the moment, but uh, that's my, I have different perspective. And then uh, Kim Jong-un, why uh, North Korea is, is asking, demanding this uh, lifting sanctions? Uh, this, actually, last year I had this Big, big question, uh, because it, uh, during the Singapore summit, North Korea never, never mentioned about asking lifting sanction. But after the, the Singapore summit, and then around the September and October, <laughs> North Korea started asking, oh, sanction lift is priority for us. And then now it's continuing. And then suddenly they start asking this, the declaration of in the war and then peace treaty maybe they seems to it's just a symbolic action and then they are not very actively they are asking one maybe uh, what i'm thinking is south korea has already provided this security guarantee 
because now we have seen what is happening in the, the border area, DMZ. There is a zero <laughs> risk for war, maybe. Then why North Korea needs this uh, uh, war declaration of war in the war or peace treaty? Then they shift, I think, then from that time, they shifted their priority from the security guarantee to the, the sanction Thank you very much. I think the time is up. Uh, we have used the allotted time, but maybe I can take the privilege to have one last question. Maybe just one of you could ask, uh, answer that. Will, my question is, will the U.S. Uh, ROK military exercises resume? Will they happen again this spring? You look at me, Lars. <laughs> Uh, I think there will be military exercises this spring. Uh, I don't think they will be on the scale uh, that we saw before this, uh, this peace process started, uh, which was maybe 300,000, 350,000 people. Uh, so it will be much smaller in scale and scope. But there will be an increased pressure from US military and ROK military to resume large scale military exercises. General Abrams, the new commander, has already stated that this is starting to, to uh, decrease uh, military readiness and by that also uh, the strategic deterrent effect of the alliance. So we will hear more about this, but I don't see we'll have major exercises this spring. Thank you. Uh, already it is known that uh, this year's exercise will be done in the reduced uh, size. So I don't know what's the actual size, but anyway much more smaller side. So thank you very much. Uh, the, as I said, there are a lot of time is up, and I would like to thank the, uh, the audience, but first of all, the, the, the speakers, and uh, maybe we open, uh, uh, thank the speakers in our traditional way of, of using our hands. So thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and uh, see you next time that we arrange a seminar.